welcome back to another Fantastic Beasts and How to Save Them. I'm PJ with ZooFit and I'm super excited about today's episode because we're not going to talk about just one particular magical creature. No, we're going to talk about a whole group of them. So because this is a, we're going to be talking about several different magical animals, we're going to break this up into a couple different parts. And this one's going to be just a little bit longer. But again, not talking about one fantastic beast, we're talking about a whole group. Today, we're going to talk about dragons. Now, dragons aren't just prolific in the Harry Potter series. They are, they are found in almost every fantasy epic series or epic story ever told. So but at some point or another, the hero of most fantasy stories crosses paths with dragons, whether they are friends, foe, or even mentors. They're also known throughout the world. There's some sort of dragon legend in most cultures and their mythology and their folklore. So it's almost a no-brainer that these animals are within our real world in some fashion. Now, dragons are large, fierce creatures, but when you look at them, they actually have some similarities to an animal that we might be a little bit more familiar with, and that is the classification of reptiles. Now, reptiles are a large group of animals that include snakes, lizards, turtles, crocodilian, and even a smaller known animal called the tuatara. These are all animals that do breathe air, just like us, just like birds, fish, birds, and, and mammals. What kind of separates them from other animals is that they lay eggs, like birds, but they lay eggs to, and their young are fully formed when they, are, when they hatch. They're also cold-blooded, which makes them different from birds. And birds are warm-blooded. Uh, reptiles are cold-blooded or what we call ectothermic, meaning they use the environment to control their body temperature. And last but not least, uh, they have scales. So again, birds have feathers, um, mammals have fur, and reptiles have scales that cover their, their body. And the difference is, of course, is that, uh, that dragons yeah, the very, have those sim similar features, but instead they also have the ability to breathe fire. <laughs> but that, that being the only difference, when creating the non-magical disguises for, uh, for dragons to keep them from being detected by muggles, it was pretty natural for the wizarding community to look to the reptiles as the ma non-magical counterparts. Now there are 10 known species of dragon in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, and yes, all 10 of them do have a reptilian disguise. But as I mentioned, there are many different types of reptiles. And the most common one of the ones that people that do uh, associate dragons with is lizards. And so it makes sense that there are a lot of lizard type dragons. And that's what we're going to talk about today is the four lizard type dragons and their hidden disguise. And again, how we can do our part to make sure that these dragons are around for generations to come. So the, five, the four dragons we're going to talk about today are going to be the Ukrainian iron belly, the Hungarian horn tail, the Chinese fireball, and the Swedish short snout. <laughs> That's actually a, quite a tongue, tongue twister there. Now first and foremost, let's go dive right in to the largest dragon of all. That would be the Ukrainian iron belly. Now from the uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them by Newt Scamander, this dragon is under constant observation ever since a particular iron belly carried off a sailing ship from the Black Sea in 1799. Luckily, no sailors were injured or, or, or harmed in this, but again, it does demonstrate how powerful and how potentially dangerous the iron belly can be. Now iron bellies have been used by wizards, and if I might interject, slightly on the abuse side for, for generations. They have multiple purposes. They were used in World War I, according to Newt Scamander, although we're not quite sure exactly how they used dragons in this instance. And they also used dra uh, iron belly dragons to guard vaults at Gringotts Banks. They use uh, pain and fear to control them. Now if an animal is going to be under close scrutiny, like the iron belly needs, well, we're going to need an animal that has a remote or has a limited range. And so we're not going to think of a sea turtle that roams the entire ocean. And we're also going to need a, a 
a, a large animal that we can find pretty easily. So again, not a tiny anole that would disappear in a blink of an eye. And I think that they found the perfect disguise for the Ukrainian iron belly in a small, or in, a, in the largest lizard in the world called the Komodo dragon. Now, Komodo dragons are named for their, the, the main island that they're found on. They're found in only five islands in Indonesia, and one of them is the island of Komodo. Now, Komodos don't breathe fire, but they do have a very venomous bite that they use to, uh, to hunt, to kill their prey, and have even harmed and killed even humans. So this is a pretty potentially dangerous animal. And coexisting with these real dragons can be difficult and for some time Komodos were uh, in danger of being of going extinct due to to poaching to overhunting and from habitat destruction now in 1989 famed sci-fi author Douglas Adams who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy went on a journey with his friend and biologist Mark Cardwin to the island of Komodo. There they highlighted the Komodo dragons and their plight for a BBC radio show called Last Chance to See. Now whether it was this sort of media attention or just simply the rise of dragons popularity in stories and fiction, people started wanting to travel to Indonesia, to these islands, to see the dragons in real life. Now this changed the attitude for the natives of the Komodo dragons and instead of fearing these animals, they started respecting them and looking at them as an economic commodity, making them worth more alive than dead. Now this is a mentality that is important for all magical creatures or non-magical creatures is by learning to appreciate them for their, uh, for their value, but also again, showing that they are worth more alive than dead is key to survive, to, for them to survive uh, modern worlds. Now the Komodo dragon, the U Ukrainian iron belly, is not completely in the clear. They still are in danger. They are still considered an endangered. But I did show that by appreciating these animals, it goes a long way. And next up we have the Hungarian Horntail. Now the Hungarian Horntail is the most, uh, considered the most aggressive and dangerous dragon of all time. But it's also probably the most popular, or at least the most recognizable. And this is the dragon that Harry Potter faced off of in the first task of the Triwizard Tournament. And even Hagrid, Hagrid was cautious of the dangers surrounding the Hungarian Horntail. So that gives you an idea of just how powerful and how fierce this creature must be. <laughs> but you have to hand it to wizards. When they chose their disguise for the Hungarian Horntail, they went again on the far opposite spectrum. Fierce, dangerous, deadly, to almost cute, not quite cuddly, horned lizard. And this is one of those instances where, once again, the point of the disguise is to hide the the fact that dragons exist. Now this is actually quite a perfect disguise for the Hungarian Horntail, not just for its appearance or hiding its, its true form, but also for the region that the, a horned lizard is found. Now in case you probably uh, aren't, familiar, aren't aware from the name, Hungarian Horntails are originally from Hungary. So again, hiding the form of a Hungarian Horntail, they moved it way even from Europe itself and transferred it to, uh, to the United States Southwest, again with the Texas horned lizard in the U U.S. Now, horned lizards are also known as horny toads. That's not a commentary on their social behavior. It's actually related to the shape of their body. They actually, again, have a more round body rather than that smooth, sleek body that lizards are typically known for. That round body resembles more of a toad. So they are known as horned toads or horny toads. And this is an iconic species for the Southwest. In fact, it is the state, state reptile of Texas. But they are also incredibly endangered. Um, due to habitat destruction and human encroachment on the environment, there's not many horned lizards left. Now, fortunately, muggle zoos are doing their part to help boost the populations. There are many zoos, particularly in the Southwest, such as Texas and Oklahoma, 
have breeding and reintroduction programs for this species. Now it is illegal to collect, sell, or even own a horned lizard from the Muggle federal and state uh, protections and laws. And it's probably a pretty good idea because who knows what kind of havoc a Hungarian horntail could really wreck in a muggle household as a pet. There's two things that you can do to help protect them. One is to support organizations and institutions that are doing their part to promote the populations and do their and and help protect these animals. So go to zoos that are breeding that are that do have them on display and even also uh, supporting the horned lizard conservation society. The other instance again was we'll talk throughout more is to is to be really cautious of what type of dragons or what type of animals you choose as a pet. Now I know that magic zoologists aren't supposed to have a favorite uh, magical creature and to an extent I am right there with you. I don't I can't pick just one animal that I love more than any other. But I will say that I, I do have favorites among different groups and, I would, and I'm also going to go out on a limb and say that um, of all the dragons and particularly the lizard type dragons, this next one, the Chinese fireball, is at the very top of my list. Now, even though they're considered one of the most ornate and most beautiful dragons uh, with maybe some, uh, with some competition with the Antipodean opal eye, they are still a very fierce dragon to contend with. They were selected to be in the Triwizard Tournament and Victor Crumb faced off with him um, to collect the, the golden egg in the first task. These dragons are a bright scarlet color with a, with a fringe of golden spikes or golden crests and their eggs are beautiful and highly prized for their use in potions. So naturally, when the wizards wanted to disguise the Chinese fireball, they went for an animal that would resemble a little bit of, their, of those characteristics. Very beautiful, unique, and, uh, and striking. And I think they nailed it. Now in 2009, I joined the Woodland Park Zoo um, as a temporary keeper, and I was assigned to the Dragon Lair. No, I mean the Slytherin House. No, sorry. The Day House, which held housed most of the reptiles. And the moment I saw the absolutely adorable Chinese crocodile lizard, I knew I was looking at the Chinese fireball in disguise. Now commonly known as the Shinosaurus, or their scientific name, this animal is again a bright, a striking coloration and they're very popular as pets. They, they, when you think about it, they tick off all the boxes. They're beautiful to look at, they're small, and they're quite unique. Now, however, this desire, this need and want for a unique pet has driven the, China, the Chinese fireball, the Shinosaurus, to near extinction in the wild. There are, only, there are only thought to be about a thousand Chinese crocodile lizards left in the wild. Now, if you wanna do your part to help Chinese fireballs, Number one is to leave them in the wild. Uh, don't get one as a pet. Again, keep in mind that this is an actual a hidden disguise for a dragon. They're not going to make great pets to begin with. They're also, uh, beyond that, uh, they thrive better in, again, certain specified conditions. But in most homes, and again, I'm not gonna say all, but most homes, if you're just looking for a special pet, something unique, something that is magical for you, we highly encourage you to go to your local humane society. Most humane societies don't just focus on cats and dogs anymore. They have hundreds of, well, dozens of different types of animals. And you can find your forever magical friend, whether it's furry, scaly, or feathered, from your local humane society and you can also have, do your part to save Chinese fireball, Hungarian horntails, and dozens of other dragons, and keeping them thriving in their natural environment. And last for today, we're gonna to be discussing of the lizard type dragons is the Swedish short snout. Now, typically not on the top of people's list of favorite dragons, this is still considerably a beautiful and respectable dragon. Uh, they are a silvery, silvery blue, with, and they shoot a blue, bright blue flame out from their nostrils. 
Now this short snout also totes the lowest body count of humans, uh, but don't think that they makes this the least dangerous dragon. It, probably the low body count is due to the fact that not many humans encounter sweet, Swedish short snouts because they often are found in uninhabited mountain ranges where people just don't go. So it has nothing to do with their lack of fierceness or their uh, potential for it to being quite deadly. As I'm sure Cedric Diggory could attest if he was around to attest when he faced off a Swedish short snout during the Tri Wizard tournament. Now, wanting to maintain that remoteness um, for the Swedish short snout is known for. And um, so, again, like the Komodo, they wanted it in an, on an island and they found the perfect, almost exact match for a Swedish short snout, just basically, again, miniature version. And again, looking at the illustrated version of Fantastic Beasts and where to find them, you'll see that. Their hidden counterpart, the, blue, the Grand Cayman Blue Iguana, is just, again, an exact match. However, they kind of fell short on that remoteness aspect. The, the Grand, Grand Cayman Island have become quite populated. Um, and while the Blue Iguana is very adaptable to the agriculture growth on, on their island, what they are losing is food sources and a little bit of their habitat. So the, the blue iguana is quite endangered. Now, once again, muggle zoos have stepped in and they've started the blue iguana recovery program, which is what we would call a head start in zoological terms, meaning that zoos collect eggs, hatch them and raise them until the, the iguana is of a certain age and a certain size that they can take care of themselves. And then they reintroduce them back into their natural environment in protected regions. And this has helped so much that the blue iguana was downlisted from critically endangered to simply endangered in 2012. And once again, it means that they still have a ways to go before they're in the clear, but they're on the right path. And if you want to see a Swedish short snout for yourself, you can check out your local zoos um, and, and institutions. Uh, many places do have that, again, that breeding program for the Grand Cayman Blue Iguana. But also, if you want to do your part to help protect these animals, ecotourism being on the rise, make sure that when you vacation, when, you are, uh, when you're on holiday, that we are as eco-savvy as possible and make our adventures as environmentally friendly as we can. All right, guys, there we have our four lizard type dragons. Again, we have 10 dragons and we're gonna go over a few more in the next part. But as you can see, there are some simple actions that we can do right at home or right in our hometown to help protect dragons around the world. And again, learning more is the absolute key. When, the more we learn, the more we appreciate nature, dragons, magical creatures, and the entire world. And the more we appreciate it, the more we want to protect it. Visiting these animals at, at, at institutions that take care of them in a proper way is not just uh, helpful for, for endangered species, but also a fun way to learn more about them and help them out, um, and help them out in, in addition. So a lot of the funds that, we, uh, that uh, zoos use for memberships and from admissions goes towards conservation projects like the Head Start program for the Blue Iguana and the Horned Lizard Reco uh, Conservation Society. And they're likely, again, as I probably imagine, as magic zoologists on, on staff, that's making sure that these animals are not just taken care of, but that we keep the statute of secrecy. We're just kind of lifting that veil, letting you learn just a little bit more appreciate them, and then learn what you can do to protect them. These institutions are making a difference and having a positive impact on not just the animal species, but on the entire planet, teaching us how to care for magical creatures and all creatures around the world. Now, this was just part one of, a, again, of a, of a little bit of a series. So we're going to delve into other types of dragons. We're going to go into snakes and, and turtle type dragons and even the crocodilian and the tuatara dragons uh, a little bit later on. But let me know what you think down below. Do you think these are great disguises for dragons? And tell me, what is your personal favorite dragon in the Harry Potter series? 
or maybe even uh, in fantasy, what is your favorite dragon that you've ever encountered while on your adventures with some of your favorite heroes in fantasy? Until next time, oh, again, remember to keep geeking out in a healthy and positive way. And again, learning all about our fantastic beasts and how to save them. I'll see you next time.